This is a special presentation from the Brighton Central School District Board of Education. Good evening and welcome to the Brighton Central School District Board of Education business meeting for February 26, 2019. Uh, we are on the road again with our Board of Education meetings. We're, call, we're coming to you this evening at an earlier time from Council Rock Primary School. We're very happy to be here. And we are here this evening as our second community forum will be held this evening at 7 p.m. So uh, to begin with today, in our, we are currently in our regular normal business meeting. So we offer the opportunity for public participation. Any members of the public that are here that wish to address the board on any matter are welcome to do so. Uh, if you are here in attendance uh, for the community forum portion, well, that will be at 7 p.m. So you can hold that till then. But is there anyone who wishes to address the board at this point in time with a question or a comment? All right, seeing that we have none at this moment, uh, board may I have a motion to approve our agenda for this evening, please. So moved. Second. Moved by Marv, seconded by Karen. I believe down there is a little bit different setup for us. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'll have to go by voice recognition. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Motion, please, then, for approval of our minutes from our January 22nd, 2019 meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Karen, seconded by Andrea. Are there any corrections, additions, or deletions to those minutes? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, tonight we are going to be receiving an update from Nate Merritt on our health, physical education, and athletics programs. Nate, welcome. Thank you so much for having us. Um, another great year um, we've had. I uh, just want to spread some highlights for um, both our health, physical education program, and then I'll take you into athletics. Uh, starting with phys ed, um, this past summer uh, we started a K-12 uh, assessment plan, um, trying to align all of our grade levels in how we're assessing uh, from the kindergarten level all the way up to our graduating seniors to make sure it's um, in line and, and we're really looking at common language um, K-12 which which has been really nice I have a really excited group of teachers that have all been working on this since um, last summer and uh, we have some really good work moving forward so we're excited about that we are currently in a, uh, a year of program review um, which we are getting some really really good insights from the community um, families out there as well as um, really good feedback from our students at our upper levels about likes dislikes um, where we would like to go with our physical education program. Um, so we're excited about um, that. By the end of the year, we'll have some good recommendations from the board that come out of the program review. So again, really excited about that. Professional development has been wonderful this year. Um, really trying to push our K-12 staff in kind of taking some risks. So we ask our kids uh, all the time to take risks and to try some new things. And so we're trying to really do that with our phys ed staff. Uh, excited to say that our, our whole high school class, our high school phys ed staff is, is now first aid CPR. The best part is they're all uh, lifeguard trained as well, which we haven't been for a long time. So which is really exciting. Um, just giving them different avenues to look at what we're teaching, how to teach it. Um, and, and again, just easier ways to guide our kids when they're in the water. So that's, that can be a hot button um, for many of our students that jump in the water. And so we, we really have seen a lot of success here in the last month during our swim unit because of the, those developments. Um, new programs, uh, always excited um, to see our high school um, and some, some really flexible programs that we've looked at over the last three years as far as uh, making things really accessible to kids, um, kids that are, you know, out for illness or long-term injuries um, to really uh, get a program that fits the student. So it's really catered to each individual student. Uh, we have a really robust online program now uh, for our 912 physical education. And uh, we, we've really seen um, some real success in that for long-term um, kids that are out, outside of phys ed for, again, uh, illness or, si or injury but also kids that uh, may come to us uh, from a different experience who are, are lacking credits uh, for graduation. We've, we've been able to kind of plot out a course for them that is much more um, accessible and also allows them to stay with their regular coursework and graduate on time. Again, something that we're, we're all striving to do and, and we've made it much easier in, in our realm. 
Uh, switching over to our health program. Uh, health program went through our program review last year, um, and so we're working on some initiatives from that program review to uh, really implement some things this year and, and for the 2019-20 year. Um, something that uh, Dr. Baker and myself talk about all the time is, is mindfulness and, and how do we really effectively get that into our classrooms. And, and it's been a really, really neat uh, time to walk into French Road and see uh, Mrs. Mix or at the high school uh, with Mr. Feltis and, and see them doing activities that are kind of outside the norm. Uh, to see kids playing in a box of sand at a high school uh, health table doesn't look like the norm. Uh, but what we've seen is that it's really giving kids the opportunity to take a break from uh, the grind of a day. Um, and so when we talk about mindfulness and really kind of resetting the mind to be motivated for the rest of their academic day, um, it, it looks a little goofy in class, I'm not going to lie. Uh, but at the same time, it's come across with great, uh, great um, reviews from the kids. Uh, they really feel that it's been helpful. Um, so not only are they doing the activities, but they're also gaining some insight of how they can do it in their own personal life. So when times get stressful, when, when you know, they have so much on their plate, they can kind of use some of these tools in their own life. So we've seen that um, work really great. And again, they're starting to learn it at Fres too. So the, the hope would be as we build forward um, that kids have some of these skill sets, um, you know, from French, French Road and up. And again, you know, looking at all of our health programs. Mental health, uh, the state of New York really put an emphasis on mental health this year in health programs. I'm, I'm happy to say that our health program was ahead of the curve on this, that uh, our mental health unit curriculum um, already met the needs of New York State prior to uh, New York State actually making it uh, required. Um, the neat part is our high school uh, health staff presented to the New York State um, Health Teachers Association um, to talk about what we've done in the past to, to help guide some of the schools that um, were starting up new program and new curriculum to really be um, you know, the, the guidance to some other programs in New York State. So excited to say that John Feltis, um, he was the health teacher of the year in New York State last year, and um, they honored him uh, right after he presented on mental health. And it was wonder wonderfully received, and um, we continue to get uh, lots of questions um, from other professionals in the state about what we're doing and, and, how, we're, um, and how, kids, how kids are really responding, because that's ultimately what we're looking for. This year, they've really tried at the high school levels to bring in professionals uh, from around the area to give kids insight about what's out there. Um, we just had um, a professional from Strong that works with uh, pharmaceuticals and, and really looking at the change of uh, dynamics in the pharma pharmaceutical world and what it was when he started out as a professional to what it is today and um, just giving some kids some looks at uh, some career paths and some options, but also ask about you know questions that might have to do with health and, and healthy lifestyles. So trying to relate the two when we bring in guest speakers, it's come across with great, great um, success from our students. Again, very similar to physical education, program alignment, um, really looking at how we align um, all the way up from you know, Council Rock here to the high school, uh, and making sure that we're using that common, langu common language and also building upon each other. Um, last year in our review, we kind of saw some stumbling blocks where we were repeating information, some of which is very, very important to repeat, and others we felt like we could do a better job of moving it places and uh, making it more age appropriate. Um, moving on to athletics, we'll go back to the last time I spoke to the board was about this time last year. So since then, we've had a spring season, a fall season, and, and a winter season that is, well, at looking at the snow, is, is still going on right now. Um, I have to say, uh, Dr. Hall and myself were really, really excited when we started this fall because um, if you look at the numbers here, our numbers are off the charts for participation. Um, in, in a, when I sit at a Section 5 table around the table with other athletic directors and they're cutting teams and they don't have enough for modified this or JV this, 
This is not a problem that we are encountering right now in Brighton. Um, and, and I think that says a lot about our staff, our program, and, and, and the, the experience that kids are having within our program because other, other kids are coming out and trying things for the first time, which is ultimately we, what we want. So 412 student athletes, grades 9 and 12. Again, at the middle school, great participation, 217. Um, I think we said that was about 45% of our high school population was playing um, was playing a sport, um, which is, that's, that's off the charts. Um, you know, if you look at past years, going back through some, some documents, um, our average probably sits about 35 to 38%, so it definitely is a spike. Um, our enrollment's up, you know, we have that little bubble coming through, but I, I think more importantly, the idea of um, really keeping kids involved at the modified level and letting them grow into sports, we're, we're, we're seeing that product now um, at the upper levels. Uh, highlights, you know, for teams, um, and, and I know I always talk about this as highlights. Again, very, very proud of all of our student athletes. Um, we continue to get really, really good compliments from all of our competitors about our coaching staffs, our kids, how we act, I think, probably is more important than any of these individual or team highlights is how we carry ourselves in a Brighton uniform. Uh, we talk about that time and time again, um, and, and our kids do so well in that area. But just highlights is our girls lacrosse team winning a sectional title, uh, lost a tough game in the state title game um, to, a, to a team from down on Long Island who was ranked number one in the country, um, and a tough 6-4 loss in the finals there. Our boys team, our boys tennis team again won the sectional title, uh, and girls track and field in an upset victory uh, won the Class B title last spring. Um, looking at this fall, uh, I really just want to take a moment that in all my years in a, as an athletic director, and Dr. McGowan and myself have talked about this, this, this past fall was something special. Uh, it's, it's, success kind of is, is contagious, um, and what we saw this fall is not only academically did we, did we do really, really well, as we always do, but um, our teams really kind of took the next step as far as success. Again, participation, as you see, up again. 482 st students at the high school um, was about 46%, 46, almost 47% of our high school. I mean, when we're looking at 50-50 of you know, participation, it's, it's really great of, of what we're looking at. Scholar-athlete teams, again, our, our teams really do this. Uh, goal, when I spoke to you last time, this time last year, a goal for us for this year was to be uh, what we call a school of excellence in New York State. Every team has to qualify with the majority of the team having 90% or above grade point average. Um, if 90% of our total teams have that, we would then be um, awarded with a school of excellence or a school, um, yeah, school of excellence is the highest um, and they have other levels as well. Our goal is obviously to shoot for that. We're right there um, already this year, having you know eight scholar teams from the fall. Uh, again, winter was about the same path, so we are right on path to be about 92%, which would which earn us that. So um, no pressure, spring teams, but it's on you right now. Um, fall 2018 highlights. Again, it was incredible. Boys soccer, uh, sectional champs, state semifinalists, uh, lost to the inevitable. Uh, state champs who again um, were a top five team in the country, um, which it was a great game to see downstate. Girls swimming and diving, uh, they've gone back to back now um, and uh, kind of have a, a, the beginning of a, a small dynasty starting as a lot of talents coming back and um, a lot of our scoring still comes back next year. Uh, Hannah Butler on that team was our New York State individual champ in diving. Um, again, just She's, she's heading to UCLA to dive next year, so um, just very, very proud of these student athletes. And again, our girls' tennis has won the last five in a row. Um, six years ago, we had a little blip in the radar, but up, up before that, it was nine in a row. So we've won quite a few ten girls' tennis titles in a row here, so um, we're hoping to keep that going as well. Um, as we get into the winter, um, something that we started this winter, um, our coaches uh, got together with me during our winter coaches meeting, and. Um, something that we've seen done by other schools and um, we kind of put our different spin on it was teacher appreciation nights. Um, everybody knows senior nights where you recognize seniors and they come out with their parents. Um, it was kind of a spin on that. Um, most of our varsity teams this winter did a teacher appreciation night 
where uh, a varsity student would then go reach out to a teacher that uh, made an impact on them, whether it was their kindergarten teacher um, all the way up to their physics teacher from this current year. Um, and they would be recognized with that student athlete, athlete at the beginning of a game. Um, I can tell you Dr. Hall was recognized by one of our hockey players. Um, just great community events. Uh, to, to see teachers come out, one of the goals was we want to see more teachers out at games participating and seeing what kids are doing outside of the classroom. Um, and this is a nice way to, one, say thank you to our teachers because they're, they're so important for these student athletes to allow them, you know, the, the flexibility of these long nights and everything like that, which is great. But more importantly, it's the relationship that we do so well here uh, to see our teachers out there um, and to have our kids saying thank you for, for all that they do. Um, Off-season athletic uh, training programs, um, our new weight room floor is in and you know I've tweeted out some pictures of our new weight room and it's, a, it's a, just a remarkable change of a facility. Uh, the space has always been really good uh, and we're lucky that we're, we're, we're taking some money to use it really appropriately for the future of our kids. Um, that's an ACL training program for our female athletes to try to curb um, ACL injuries as we move forward. Uh, we have, you know, uh, our st strength and conditioning, which are our core lifts for all off-season athletics. Uh, Coach Steve Leon has done a really, really good job in the off-season of kind of catering this to all the other sports. Um, so, you know, on any given day now, we have about 120 student athletes on Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the weight room from all different uh, sports levels working out for a common goal of, you know, getting better and getting stronger, but more importantly, staying healthy in the off season. So um, really, really happy about uh, the start of that. And again, uh, this year we can't say enough about our new facilities. Uh, I, as I was leaving here and I was talking to Lou Alamo, uh, I'm hoping the green stays for as long as it can on that turf. Uh, so next Monday we can get our lacrosse teams out on the field. Um, I, wasn't real happy when I came in and saw the weather warning for four to seven inches, but uh, we're going to make a plan somehow, some way. Uh, but if you see here, our new weight room floor with the B emblem, our new tennis courts, which are beautiful. Uh, we hosted um, the Class A sectionals uh, for other teams there. We are a hot commodity as far as hosting. We're centralized in Rochester, New York. Um, we're going to be hosting the girls lacrosse regionals this upcoming spring on our new turf field. Um, so. It's really nice to have uh, these facilities. One, we get to show them off to other schools, but more importantly, our kids get really, really uh, good quality product to play on on any given day. Again, we continue to look at student leadership uh, pro programs, uh, captain's club, um, looking at the summer development. Anyone that is interested in being a captain on a, on a varsity team, um, joining us for a captain's club to talk about what's important to them as student leaders. Um, on a team. Uh, it's an ongoing problem everywhere we go uh, to see, you know, really getting the good out of our student leaders to be um, vocal, to lead by example, all of the above, but to give them almost like a toolbox to what they might see as they move forward as student leaders. Um, partnership with Special Olympics. Um, we, we, there is a unified basketball team uh, league in Monroe County and, and, and we have never had a, the amount of kids to in order to participate. So uh, currently in talks with Special Olympics about doing a Brighton day just for us. That would be kind of K-12. Uh, we have a great experience going to the Monroe County Special Olympics with our kids, um, but doing something in-house that we could host with just our kids K-12 um, is, is something that really is not done that often, but Special Olympics is kind of pushing the envelope to do some different things, and, and we're excited to say, yes, let's, let's try. So. Um, and again, health and physical education, just really continuing to push the envelope as far as curriculum goes, uh, aligning our assessments, and, and, and more importantly, encouraging our teachers to take some risks to continue to do good work as we move forward. So thank you all. I appreciate it. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, you know, thank you, as always, for the update. Um, Thank you for the recognition, certainly for all of our student athletes, but especially to our teachers, our health and physical education teachers, and all of our coaches, you know, those that are on staff, those that volunteer, that will all make it happen for our kids. So thank you very much for your oversight and leadership in that regard. Uh, let's move then to our report section for this evening, please, board. First up, uh, we have 
uh, financial report. Uh, we have a treasurer's report from Lou and Dahlia. We also have Lou's memorandum on the executive summary for the budget status report. Uh, may we have a motion to accept those reports, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Larry and seconded by uh, Marv. Any further questions or comments, anybody? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Our student representative report tonight, uh, and Terrace is here tonight, uh, substituting. Tool is a little under the weather today, so thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a lot going on since we just came back from break, but um, we have spring sports starting next week, which Mr. Merritt talked a little bit about, and the girls' Nordic team just won states for the first time, I think, in Brighton history. So that's exciting. <laughs> And then our big, like, next event is Ham Jam, which is on Friday. If you don't know what Ham Jam is, it's a student-run talent show, and it's basically a fundraiser for the senior class, so all the proceeds to that go towards funding, like, ball, banquet, bash, our senior gift. Um, that's kind of it for what's happening, and then the one thing that Tool asked me to figure out was a date for March 11th to 15th. Um, mm -hmm for some board members to come in for Student Senate. Yeah, she had sent us an email, and I had sent her a note back, and uh, we traditionally do meet as a group with BHS Student Senate along with Dr. McGowan, and uh, she and I have gone back and forth on email on a couple of dates, times, and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll have something together, I think, uh, with the board here shortly, and I'll send her a note, and then she can okay. get that set up. Perfect. We look forward to that. It's one of the highlights of the year, so yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Yep. We always appreciate that invitation. Mm -hmm. And thank you for being able to come on short notice yeah. today. We appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Board of Education reports, uh, our Monroe County School Boards Association standing committees, uh, labor relations. Yes, tomorrow, um, we're going to have a, a talk about the update on the uh, minimum wage impact um, update by Lisa Ryan for BOCES 1 and bus driver sor shortages uh, from Bill Harvey, Director of Transportation, Honey Island Falls, and Bruce Capron the assistant superintendent from for business operations there. Fantastic. Thank you, Marv. Appreciate that. Uh, information exchange. Yeah, it's uh, the next meeting is Wednesday, March 13th, and the speaker will be talking on restorative practices. Yeah, that was uh, the, the 13th. We were, a bunch of us were signed up to go, and unfortunately, they had to get canceled because of weather, and the speaker yeah. Yeah. couldn't get in on a flight. So. Uh, they're trying to redo that. I don't know if that's going to be able to be fit in yet this year, but we'll see if they can. So thank you very much. Uh, legislative committee, we met on the, um, the 6th of this month and debriefed of the legislative breakfast that we'll talk about a little bit. Um, and we also then discussed, and that again was a weather day. It and was a weird half weather of our day. Car, that was the slippery ice, ice type yeah. stuff, yeah. And about half of the group could make it. But uh, we also did final planning for the Albany trip, uh, which is next Monday, Tuesday. Um, so that's, that's where things are. That's this time of the year, the time of the year that it is, if you will, for the budget from New York State. And so uh, at full speed ahead on that. And then the next legislative committee that will meet that Wednesday. So we'll go to Albany. We'll be in Albany Monday, Tuesday. And then the legislative committee will meet again on Wednesday. So. That's uh, current on those three committees. Mark, you have an update on BOCES for this evening? Uh, not much to report. They're going to meet uh, this Thursday. Okay. Uh, and also now, as, uh, as we traditionally do, other board member reports, uh, a little bit of a, a quick overview of some of the activity that we've been involved with individually since the last time we had a business meeting. I'll start at the far end. And Christina, do you have anything to update? Uh, library and Media meets March 13th. And that will be uh, assessing surveys that went out. Okay, great. Thank you. Andrea? Yeah, the Foreign Language Review met February 5th. We have a meeting um, in March. Uh, we discussed placement requirements, and, and we're really just trying to align our program with the New York State standards. And really, ha we we're actually having a discussion of changing the name of the department um, sort of to align with what New York State is calling it. So. Um, world language that we're, we're working it through. So that's part of one of the things we're doing. And I um, was met um, two Fridays ago at the uh, diversity equity meeting with on um, the special ed program. And um, we're just, we started to pinpoint the data that we plan on using to analyze 
um, to determine where we're the disproportionate this, where we're disproportionate in in our with our kids in, that, okay. in the special ed department. Great, and you know that's a great reminder to the community too. Our diversity equity committee uh, has three. This year's most of the work this year is concentrated in three subcommittees, and each of those subcommittees does have a board member as an integral integral member of the, of the subcommittee. So thank you for reporting on that, group. Mm -hmm. Larry. Well, obviously we had. Uh, a Back on the 12th, I think it was, Mark, you, Karen, and I had our audit committee meeting. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of things working on there. Obviously, Lou's going to do a brief update as well on some of the fiscal controls that we'll take a look at, so that went well. Um, and then it's construction, construction, construction. We're meeting just about every Monday with Lou and the different groups that are working on the different schools. Um, if you walk outside Council Rock, you see a bunch of really cool trucks. There's probably a bunch of young kids who love what they're seeing right now around here. <laughs> but uh, construction season is upon us. And I know we're going to talk more about bids in a little bit, but there's a whole lot of work happening, and i um, um, just very excited about what we're going to create here over the next few years. Well, thank you. And again, a reminder, you are our representative for that committee, uh, owner architects and, and engineers, and uh, along with our construction manager. We appreciate your efforts and your work toward that. And you're right, uh, coming up on the agenda, we have a number of construction and facilities related issues that we're going to talk about. So thank you. Karen? My committees have not met since our last business meeting on January 22nd. So coming up, um, Curriculum Council's meeting March 7th, and um, Diversity Equity, I'll be meeting with them on March 14th regarding the Family Engagement Subcommittee. I know that Debbie has an opportunity to attend a webinar and several other members of the Family Engagement team are going to attend a webinar with um, Steve Constantino, who's one of the people whose work we've been delving into this year. Um, that's been a great conversation about being able to broaden our horizons when it comes to engaging with resources. Um, and I think that, that's, that those are valuable conversations. So I look forward to continuing that work. I was able to attend the legislative breakfast with Marv, yourself, um, Julene. Um, Mark and I sat with Jamie Romeo, and that was, I had not met her yet, so that was an interesting. Yeah, Christina was at our table. Oh, right, Christina, also, that's yeah. true. So yeah. I apologize, Christina. Um, it was interesting for me to be in the position of, of educating a new legislator versus mm -hmm. working with somebody who, who's already deeply ingrained mm -hmm. in the system. So. I think that's a unique opportunity yeah. for us to, especially in this budget season, to get our issues across to Jamie. Oh, she's, Jamie, she's a fresh set of ears, and I don't think that that's a bad thing, although I know that we've lost some of our connections um, with yeah. Joe's departure, but, but it was an, for me, it was one of the more interesting legislative breakfasts I've been able to attend. It was not the same old, same old. So. It was a little different, yeah. It Thank was. you. Uh, teacher Center Policy Board met on the 14th and we looked at uh, 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 learning spaces for the uh, 20, 21st, 20, 20th, 21st century and it was quite interesting. Um, everybody else is, uh, Christine has mentioned the library review meets on March 13th and the curriculum council on the 7th and yes, I was at the legislative breakfast also. You were there also, yes sir. <laughs> Despite the weather. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, wellness Committee meets tomorrow, and um, we're continuing the work that we've been doing all year. And now, almost two weeks ago, Say Yes to the Dress at Brighton High School was a huge success. It was a wonderful day. And lots of dresses, tuxedos, shoes, handbags, and jewelry found new homes and new owners and new closets. And it was a really feel-good day. And... Um, it was, I'm, I finally recovered. <laughs> it was tiring, but it was worth every minute. It was great. That is such a wonderful thing. And, you know, Kevin and I got a chance to come in and say hi. And uh, just seeing that and all of the effort that goes into that, certainly community members who donated goods, but all of the folks who helped that day, and the three, I believe, seamstresses who work all day there to make sure garments can be taken home or picked up at the end of the day. And I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, I don't know if ahead. you know how many kids were served that day, students that came through. We know it's well over 100. I was going to say it's mm -hmm. somewhere it's at 100, 100, 100, 100. Yeah, it's, which is a tremendous, tremendous thing to do. And it's just a fun, fun thing. And I encourage any of our folks on the board, certainly, but anybody from <coughs> our teaching staff and administrative team, when that event happens, to walk through the auditorium and just to take a look. It's really well, we appreciate thing. it when everybody comes yeah, in. It's yeah, it's really proud of it's really of the setup the is event. amazing. It's you know, quite so. fun, and it's like a pop-up store. 
we, um, our grounds, building and grounds people transport everything for us on Wednesday around noon hour. School ends Wednesday, we come in and we set up. We're ready to roll at eight o'clock Thursday morning and at four o'clock Thursday afternoon we break it all down and it, buildings and grounds returns it to us on Friday. It's quite, so it's, it's quite a, a, an operation. We move over 400 dresses over and back to um, get an idea of how big it is. And red carpets and, and yeah. handbags and bins of purses yeah. and uh, shoes. So yeah. it's a, quite an operation. Andrea, you're the, that's right. You're there also and along with a large group. I don't want to start naming everybody because no, I'll forget two. more. But okay. uh, it's, it's, it's really one of those signature events, I would call it. I think so. so. Yeah. 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 So thank you. So among a lot of the other things I've been working on, I want to highlight activities right now. It's been mentioned, but right now a lot of my effort is around Albany and the budget. And uh, as, as was mentioned, five of us, I believe, were able to make the legislative breakfast, which was a little different this year uh, with the change in Albany, the Senate going uh, uh, Democratic from Republicans. So that's changed the dynamics in upstate quite a bit. Jamie Romeo now represents us in the assembly, as Karen uh, mentioned. We got a chance to sit. I was able to lead the table discussion with that group. Um, Kevin and Lou and I met with Jamie and Justin Wilcox. Many of you that uh, may know Justin, who's a Brighton dad, a member of the Monroe County Legislature, and he is on Jamie's staff, one of her key staffers. And uh, we met with them to go over very specifically the numbers as regard to Brighton. And uh, we're going to talk much, much more about it as we move forward. But the governor's budget uh, does not anywhere near uh, adequately address the aid that should be coming to the Brighton School District and the, and the citizens and residents of Brighton. Um, and we are attempting to do everything we can to make, it, make that happen in a way that's more appropriate, fair, and responsive to the needs of our community. Um, I will be in Albany on Monday and Tuesday. Kevin will be in Albany also with the superintendent's group. Uh, we will have individual meetings and group meetings. Um, we will continue to educate and uh, push for um, corrections to be made where they can be. Uh, Kevin and Lou and I also had the opportunity to meet with uh, members of our community group, uh, the Fight for, Bright Fight for Brighton group in the past and discussed with them some possible uh, actions moving forward. So it's, uh, it's key time right now from now through really probably about the next three weeks are key to what the final budget will look like from New York State. And um, it's important that uh, the governor uh, see his way clear to appropriately and adequately fund public education and we'll do all we can to make our voices heard on that. So that's my activity at the moment. So uh, our other reports today, uh, our Brighton Teachers Association report, unfortunately Beth is under the weather also, so we'll include her report in uh, which he returns and, and get that to us. Our PTSA report, Leslie, welcome. Um, okay, at BHS, the BHS PTSA meeting with the principal this month dealt with the topic of course selection. They had a huge turnout at both their noon and 7 p.m. meetings. Uh, BHS, Coco and Cram had about 80 freshmen who showed up to get help from seniors and teachers. PTSA provided cookies and hot cocoa. The BHS PTSA was introduced by Dr. Hall at the eighth grade parent orientation and said a few words to parents of incoming students. The snowball dance was the Saturday after midterms. BHS PTSA provided punch and chocolates. PTSA's SPED committee will be holding its meeting with the principal at the high school on March 19th. The topic will be navigating college choices for atypical students. And BHS PTSA is now act actively involved in the Brighton Believes Day coming up on March 6th. At TCMS, um, the PTSA sponsored its next round of activity nights. Grade 6 had 140 students attend, grade 7 had 192 students attend, and grade 8 had 85 students attend. Um, PTSA at TCMS is assisting um, the TCS, TCMS Student Council with cookie dough sales. Proceeds are to go to the Student Hardship Fund at TCMS. Um, the PTSA hosted a book club event. A parent who is a child and family counselor led the discussion of two books, Untangled by Lisa Demore and The Teenage Brain by Francis Jensen. It was a well-attended event. At FRES, uh, the book fair 
with new vendor Follette went very well. Next year it will be scheduled earlier in the school year. Uh, the next round of PTSA roller skating events for each grade occurred in January and had good attendance. Um, the Fres PTSA hosted two meetings with the principal, the counseling office, talked about the second step program in January and assessments were discussed in the February meeting. Um, the Fres's PTSA summer activities fair occurred on January 28th. Vendors from various camps set out tables with info for summer offerings. Um, Fres's PTSA movie night was held on January 31st showing Mr. Lemoncello's library. The movie tied into the whole, the whole school reading the book. As usual, the attendance was excellent. Fres PTSA helped with the always record-setting Jump Rope for Heart on February 12th through the 14th. And PTSA held its second family game night on Valentine's Day. It was a good time was had by all. At Council Rock, the PTSA held a very successful toy and book drive in January. Donations went to organizations that helped those in need. Um, Council Rock PTSA continues to host Fun Food Friday in the school during lunchtime. Edamame was sampled in January and olives were sampled in February. Uh, the Council Rock PTSA hosted a Super Bowl for teachers and staff. Volunteers brought in a variety of soups and chili. They had so many donations, uh, it took uh, five eight-foot tables to hold everything. It was a big success. And lastly, the Council Rock PTSA sponsored, is sponsoring a extracurricular activities fair on March 5th from 6.30 to 8 in this uh, cafeteria. Several area community programs will be coming to showcase extracurricular activities available for kids focusing on ages five through eight. Great, thank you very much, Leslie, we appreciate it. And thank, you, thank you for being able to come this evening at the earlier time too. Uh, Dr. McGowan, Superintendent's Report. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to just start out by acknowledging uh, an event that was tragic in our district, but something uh, that brings to light a tremendous amount of caring and warmth in this community as well. And just ask everybody to pause for a moment and remember our colleague and friend, Shelley Fitzgerald, who was a teacher here who passed away uh, just prior to the break. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Shelly was a PTSA uh, life member. She was a incredibly well-regarded special education teacher, both at the high school and the middle school. And uh, again, tragically passed away after a battle with breast cancer. And her family has been uh, very expressive in their gratitude to the community, to all of you, to many staff members in our district uh, who helped with some very challenging uh, moments from Lou and his staff Judy, of course, and, and her work and support of her colleague, Kim Lanzafane, uh, but her department members, her colleagues on staff, the entire middle school staff, uh, administrators, parents, parents who brought their children and visited with Shelly and were able to tell Shelly the impact that she made in their life, which is really what this all revolves around, a person who gave so much to so many in this community and we're grateful for that. So thank you for pausing for a moment and recognizing, uh, again, our colleague and friend who we Greatly appreciate her contribution. Uh, I'd like to move on to a couple other items and, and uh, reiterate our appreciation um, uh, for everything that, that you've acknowledged for that our community does. And I'd like to recommend that in the future I get to go first because you've mentioned almost all these things so far. Uh, but one thing not mentioned and we did communicate yesterday about was the uh, rankings of our school uh, ratings in a recent poll. And I think it's important to point out that we don't. Uh, measure ourselves by every one of the new rankings that come out or spend a tremendous amount of time pointing those things out or uh, shooting for a particular ranking, knowing more about the work that's done each and every day by our staff, uh, by staff members like Shelley, by staff members like Judy, by the many teachers and administrators who invest so uh, deeply in each child. However, it is also nice to point out when somebody does recognize us for doing pretty great work, especially when it's uh, such a, a significant number, right? So to be considered the best in this area, um, among the, the best in the state, and then in the top 50 of 10,000 schools ranked nationally is really impressive. And it does deserve a moment to simply say, although we don't live for those, uh, we certainly appreciate that acknowledgement and know that there are so many people in our community uh, that contribute to that. So we, we thank everybody for that. 
Nordic Ski Champs, of course, mentioned. Thank you very much for that. Indoor track also this past weekend was very, very successful. And kids will be participating in states. I think more important than any of these other pieces, the Day of Caring that's coming up. So it's been called Bright Blues Day, Bright Blues and Caring Day, Bright and Blues Day of Caring. Whatever it is, it's about an incredible gesture across the entire district on March 6th to demonstrate caring uh, for other people and thinking about our brain beliefs. And as we develop young leaders in this district and, and citizens who contribute so much, we're thinking about all of the different ways that kids develop. And pausing for a second to give back is an important part of that. Uh, we're really excited about that. And it only happens with a tremendous amount of support from staff members, from the TTSA, from community members, and uh, spearheaded, of course, in large part by Katie Falter and Julian Gilbert. So thank you. Say yes to the dress, of course, uh, such a success. Another example of that, and, and these important things that happen here in our community to support everybody. Festival of Ideas also, and thanks to the PTSA this weekend, Saturday. Uh, so excited for so many kids to come here and participate in a different kind of day of learning. It is the 30th Festival of Ideas, mm -hmm. and uh, we're really excited about that as well. Construction continues, you mentioned, uh, to the excitement of a lot of uh, young uh, people, certainly in this building with big trucks. Uh, primarily among them, a young man who seems very enamored by the construction, thanks to Matt Tapman and uh, his staff for everything they've done in this building to keep it a great learning environment for kids while there's a lot happening around them. And uh, kids are pretty much focused on what they need to do every day, which is great. The adults are too, but they're creating that atmosphere. And it's much appreciated. If you've ever lived with any kind of renovation in your home, happening while you're living in the home, uh, Council Rock is experiencing it now and will be for a while, and we appreciate their patience and that their staff is really making it the best environment possible. And a lot of communication is going out to families in this building and the community about what is happening, and we encourage community members to keep reaching out to us so we can help uh, adapt what we're doing to make the most sense for everybody right around the building, too. Um, the budget process also continues. Tonight at the community forum, we'll hear really important updates about feedback from the community in addition to what's happening in the area of diversity and equity. So uh, two primary topics happening tonight and then an opportunity for community members to have a discussion about those topics or whatever else might be on their mind. Around the budget, it's important to note that we have a community budget forum next week. Um, as we're thinking about Brighton Believes, we also have that evening an opportunity to talk about our beliefs relative to the budget process. Uh, community Forum 7 to 8.30 and then on the 20th, March 20th, 1 to 2.30. And those are both in the boardroom at Central Office. So on the 6th, 7 to 8.30 and on the 20th, 1 to 2.30. And these dates and times are all published on the website as well. The executive budget proposal will be made on March 26th with a lot of updates in between that as we continue to look at what the revenue picture looks like and what potential expenditures are going into next year. And advocacy continues, of course. Mark mentioned all the different uh, ways that we're engaging in that. I would also encourage people to check out the Facebook page for Fight for Brighton to find out how they can engage as a community in this conversation as well. Contacting Assemblywoman Romeo or Senator Robach is a great idea as well, and all that information is available to people. And I know that Fight for Brighton is uh, great partners uh, as they were when we first started this conversation with the state, uh, continues to think about ways to advocate and is heavily engaged in this conversation. We appreciate all of their efforts as well. You know, if we go back a couple years ago, that conversation and the incredible work that was done to advocate for solutions in the budget process, essentially what the state has done is included that money where it was, but then overwritten the formula so as to change the way some of the variables are treated and uh, start in many ways from scratch. So the money that was secured at that point is still there, but the factors in the formula that should accelerate uh, the distribution of aid based on our factors in our district are overwritten in the governor's proposal and proposed to be treated differently. And so that doesn't mean that that work wasn't incredibly significant. It was, and it is still there. The question is now, how do you push back against a governor's proposal to say, wait a second, these things are still important, and our aid should uh, keep pace with what was promised back two years ago and secured by, again, incredible efforts in our community at that point. So we're working on that. The community will get an email tomorrow uh, with the thought exchange results that you're hearing tonight and uh, a link to an advocacy letter that was sent to our state representatives explaining some of the issues that we're encountering and what our disagreement is uh, with the executive's proposal and uh, given information about Fight for Brighton and ways that community members can engage in that process as well. Um, that's all I have, and uh, again, we'll keep working on that. I'm looking forward to community forum at 7 p.m. tonight. Any questions for me?
Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up this evening, uh, a bit of a technicality. Uh, we, uh, may we have a motion, please, to approve the 2019-2020 school calendar? So moved. Second. Moved by Karen and seconded by Christina. Uh, this uh, was on the agenda for our February 12th meeting that had gotten uh, canceled due to the weather. Uh, but we, we did go ahead and release it. It had been vetted cl clearly and carefully, and we were comfortable with, with everything in it. But we do technically have to approve it uh, in session, so that's what we're doing this evening. Uh, but the, it's not a new calendar. For those of you that have a copy of it already, uh, uh, that have taken a look at it, it is the calendar. So all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And have we posted this on the website yet? Dan, we did, didn't we? I thought so. So that is on there for all those that uh, want to take a look at the rest of uh, this calendar year and the next calendar year and making plans around that. Um, we also have, we mentioned earlier, we have this evening a couple of agenda items with regard to construction bids, construction contracts, and our facilities improvement projects. So I'm going to ask Lou uh, to step to the podium now to give us a bit of an overview on uh, a couple key areas, and then we'll, we'll work through each one of those when we get to those on the agenda. So, thank you. Sure. So, what the board's being asked to consider tonight are the bids for phase two of the um, Bright Facilities Improvement Plan project approved by the voters in May of 2017. I'm on the right one, right? Okay, there's two. <laughs> so this is the SEI side of, of the contract. So the work that's being done at uh, French Road Middle School and at the high school. So in anticipation and while the bids were on the street, we were getting feedback from contractors that um, some of our fears that we presented on the SWBR side of the project were coming to fruition in that there was a shortage of uh, qualified contractors to do the work and people were starting to roll up the plans and specifications and we're not going to bid on this project. As a result, the construction managers, uh, manager, campus construction, cautioned us that the prices may come in higher than what was projected at, at the point in time. So what we did to make sure that the board is able to award uh, the most significant portion of the project is we carved out alternates equivalent to what we thought the overage might be. So what's being presented to you tonight is uh, the majority scope of work, but we've carved out an amount so that we can maintain the construction contingency and keep the board within the voter authorization. However, to complete the entire scope of work that was promised to the community and what the voters approved, we'll need to tap into our capital reserves. So on the May um, referendum, will present um, a proposition to withdraw additional money, approximately $2.8 million, so we can complete the entire scope of work that was presented to the community and still honor the tax impact um, that the voters considered when they went to the polls in May of 2017. Lou, just to clarify, because this is really important, when we go forward with that, and we'll discuss between now and then, because we are going to be updating at virtually every meeting where we are with construction plans, that, uh, item on the ballot in May will be just to allow the withdrawal from an existing capital reserve fund. Correct. It is not a additional borrowing and it's not an additional tax impact or anything like that. So Correct. So we'll, we'll our clarified. building uh, capital reserve fund that we uh, withdrew from, we withdraw from every year, mm -hmm. that will be an amount and then once we have voter authorization reauthorization of the capital project for the increased anticipated expenditures we will draw that amount and we'll rebid it and so we just had to adjust the timing a little bit all the work is still uh, will be completed we just need to dip into savings a little bit more to, which is not really done. a total surprise and totally unexpected you know these are the type of things in a, on a project over this many years that will, that will fluctuate some based on current bidding conditions in the market and the other thing just to remind folks is any of our reserve funds to have money withdrawn from them requires voter approval. So Correct. that's why that we have to do that. Correct, so we'll have to get uh, authorization to get the full anticipated expenditures of the project uh, approved. And then, like I said, there'll be another uh, phase three mm -hmm. um, of this project that the board will consider at a later date. Okay. okay. Larry, uh, as our representative uh, to the group and to you're involved in the weekly and monthly meetings, is there anything additional that you would like to add to 
these upcoming agenda items? Just a couple of comments. One, um, Lou's done a great job of anticipating this possibility. Campus did a great job of anticipating this possibility. The commitment to the community remains the same. Um, as Lou said, timing's a little bit different with a couple of pieces of the project, but all the things we said we would get done will get done. We joke about this sometimes because the focus of this overall project has been sort of council rock, but as you heard Lou just say, we're hitting the other three schools pretty good and positively impacting those environments over there. This is a lot of work over a few years. Um, the, utilizing the, the capital reserve as a contingency is the right way to go. We're going to hit all our commitments for the work to get done. As Lou said, change up the timing a little bit to get it. Um, what you have in the market, you can read this in the paper a lot, is a whole bunch of people doing work, and in some cases, a shortage of workers. We hear about that a lot, people going into the trades and all. So we're seeing a lot of that, and these contractors are saying, we don't have enough people to get all this work done. There is a glut of work and a shortage of resources, and that's in the commercial sector, in the public sector, actually, quite frankly, even in the private sector of, you know, so, um, none of this is unusual. The plan is really solid going forward. But we'll have these conversations a lot over the next few years as we look at how the market changes in the next couple of years, if it changes at all. Right. So, yeah. Well, we appreciate the update. And, and again, a reminder to folks in the community and to our staff um, that we will continue to be transparent and fully disclose and discuss all of these issues with regard to the facilities improvement. And it is a long term project, as you mentioned. Uh, we have great partners in uh, campus construction and, and our architects and now all the contractors who are coming on board with us. So it's, uh, it is being managed very well, both from a uh, work in progress standpoint and from a capital resource standpoint. So we'll continue to have conversation and discuss and make decisions where we need to, to uh, make sure things happen the way that we have told the community that they would. So, okay, well, thank you very much. Then to begin with, could we have a motion, please? And actually, this first one, agenda item number eight, uh, was originally on the February 12th um, meeting agenda. But a motion, please, to approve the construction bid outlined in the memo from Lou to Kevin on February 12th with regard to the uh, alternate EC2 for Council Rock. So moved. Second. Any further questions or comment, anybody? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, we also tonight have a resolution, uh, please, a motion to approve the resolution as prepared by Kim for our official newspapers. So moved. Second. Moved by Julene, seconded by Mark. <coughs> and this is something that we have to do to uh, officially designate the variety of uh, publications where we will publish uh, legal notices. Uh, as we move through all the different things that we work on, especially the upcoming uh, budget vote, board elections, and things like that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call Lou back up for a brief uh, explanation, but a motion, please, for approval of item number 10, the approval of the estimated tax cap levy limit notification. So moved. Second. Moved by uh, Andrea and seconded by Karen. Uh, Lou, would you, I mean, we have uh, this and it is posted on the agenda this evening. This is the official calculation to the state, uh, taking into account all the bits and pieces that are required uh, to calculate our tax cap, our tax levy limit <coughs> cap, correct? Correct. There's just one piece, if you want me to. Yeah, just, just, to just clarify or correct me that's all right you can say that no 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 you're absolutely right it just one of the things I, I think is important as we start the, the budget conversation is the factors our calculation is 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 pretty easy mathematically to be able to follow it it's based on the the two percent inflation rate and a small property tax growth factor what you will see in future years that you're not seeing this year is an exclusion for the capital tax levy because as we talked about before we've we've been receiving more building aid than we anticipate our mortgage or our debt to be, that we're not getting an exclusion. So as the debt comes on and the building aid will follow, there's no exclusion this year in the, in, in the, um, in the formula. So that's a significant, that's the only thing I wanted to know. Okay. Um, uh, the community will see increased expenditures, but they're not necessarily gonna see any exclusion in the tax cap. So our levy limit is 2.3%, 2.34%, excuse me, um, without any capital exclusion. You'll see that number grow in the future as um, 
old borrowings come on and the new new debt comes on. But to pay the mortgage for 2019-20, there's no exclusion. So that will put even more pressure to stay within that 2.34% tax cap. And Lou, will that begin, is that a one-year gap or is that, do we anticipate that to be a two-year gap before those funds start rolling back into the formula from state? So we have building aid from older projects right. falling off. Right. And we've been getting reorganization incentive aid um, for when we consolidated the middle school. So we've been getting that for, for a number of years. That falls off in the next couple of years. Okay. So we're going to see the debt exceed our building aid over the next couple of years. So that'll drive our lot to be up next year. But we have to have the amount to pay this year's mortgage right. up front. Okay. So it, it's really, so, so the we're formula gap, doesn't match what our actual experience is. There's, there's a time lag, if you will, a gap period that we're right. in. Because it considers all aids. It doesn't right. consider project specific aids. Right. And that's something we've been advocating for is let's match up actual dollars to inflows and outflows. The formula doesn't provide for that. So it bundles a whole bunch of things that doesn't work to our benefit in this okay. year's calculation. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, does anyone have anything further question? As Lou, as Lou uh, detailed, the uh, tax levy limit then is calculated uh, for us for 2018-2019 would be 2.34% which is pretty much what we've been talking about for the last few months. And this is officially making a calculation. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. I don't know why you'd oppose because I wish you got a better idea than I, <laughs> I don't know about. <laughs> uh, motion please then for approval of agenda item number 11. This is approval of construction contract. Uh, this is the this is the phase two facilities improvement project. Actually, oh, is that a duplicate? Okay, so that was item number, the one we already did was that one, right? Okay, I'm sorry, thanks, Kim. I thought I had it figured out and I still was confused. It's, okay, it's so. Also, it's also number 14 as well, it's on three times, I don't know how it can be three times. Well, no, 14 is it's a different one, because 14 is the one oh, covering phase two for uh, the high school TCMS right. in French Row. Right. Okay, so, all right, then uh, agenda item number 11 is a duplicate of agenda item number eight. eight. No. I'm no. sorry. The EC2 one was related to the SWBR portion of the project. Culture this rock. is what I spoke to the larger phase two of the SEI side. So it is two it different is. actions. Yeah. Okay, so we're not deleting this item. No. Okay. So this is, sorry. okay. All right, so then it is, as Lou just outlined, it is the approval of that uh, EC2 as it relates to the remainder of that portion, correct? That was not included in the other. EC2, the memo from February 12th, was related to the SWBR side of the project, right. and that's the electrical contract for that scope of work. The campus memo is phase two on the SEI side, and that's what I was speaking to. Okay, and that's 14. The, the campus memo, though, is specific to the high school, middle school, and French Row that right, I so have. That's the SEI side. Right. So, do we have an item? I guess is where I'm back to here. Is there actually an item number 11? Yes. 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 The EC2, the electrical content, the memo of February 12th. Yeah, but that's what we just approved. And I read for the construction bid project. I thought that's what we were approving there. See what I'm saying? No, I, I think we approved the February 26th one. The February 12th one is what I was referring to on item number eight. That was, that's what's in the, in the, correct, in the, I see what you're saying. You see what I'm saying on the agenda. So I'm of the um, I'm of the understanding that there are two different um, things, not three. Or are there three? There are three. There's there's the twenty sixth, there's the twelfth, and there is right. The co op electricity bid. That's separate. That's separate. That's the third. But that's the third. Yeah, but that's a different. That's not has anything to do with construction. Yes. Right. Yes, that's we have three. Is. We have three bids total to approve. The first is from February 12th. That's the SWBR. 
The second is February 26th. That's the, the SEI. Right. And then the third is unrelated to the capital project. That's operations. Right, right. Yeah. it's an operations. Yeah. So really, what, what, we, what it was is items number, item number eight and 11 are the same item. And then item number 11, I mean, item number 14 is the 26th memo from campus. And then separately, item number 15 is a cooperative energy bid, which is an entirely different bid. Am I, am I still missing something, or That's is that correct. correct? That's correct. OK. Kim, figure that out. So this would be when you combine? Multiple meetings in one meeting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what yeah. I, I thought we had it figured out. That's been the latest. And they, they need to be specific yeah. about yeah. bids and contracts. Right. So, right. right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so what we what we voted on at number eight. Just so we're all clear. At number eight was combining into eight number eleven. The Council Rock EC two bid. Right. Okay. So those were two items handled at number eight on the agenda. Then we're going to handle these other two separately coming up. Correct. Well, everybody's good now? Yep. Okay. Right now, we now are at approval of the corrective action plan related to the extra classroom activity funds financial report. That's number Which 12. Which has nothing to do with the Different. rest. Which has nothing to do. And I apologize. <laughs> I should have grouped these things. Way different. I, I think I think the fact that we lost the last meeting. I think got we us pushed things in there that up. yeah, I was looking at like yeah. five different agendas. Yeah. And yeah. It's my fault. But anyway. All right, so a motion please to approve the correction action plan that you have in front of you related to the extra classroom activity funds financial report, please. So moved. Second. Moved by Marv, seconded by Larry. Larry mentioned an audit committee uh, when we met, uh, we discussed the extra classroom activity funds, uh, the audit report from Ray Wager, CPA, uh, Mangle Betts Bar Division there, um, had provided to the district, and then this is the uh, corrective action plan to deal with that report that we have and that is posted. Any further questions or comments? Nope. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Item number 13, we are accepting the monthly capital project report um, that is the monthly progress report from January 2019 uh, from prepared by campus. And uh, may we have a motion to accept that, please? So moved. Second. Uh, moved by was it Christina? Uh, Andrea. Okay, Andrea and uh, seconded by Larry. Anything further, question, comments on that? That's our, just basically our monthly update report on our project that we have and is posted. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Now back to awarding bids in construction <laughs> projects. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> item number 14, please. A motion to approve the uh, facilities improvement project, phase two, contract recommendations. Uh, that's the campus memo, which includes projects at the other three school buildings. Uh, as outlined in that uh, letter dated February 26th. So okay, we have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Moved by Karen, seconded by Christina. Anything further on this bit or We keep saying SEI and SWBR, just so everybody knows those are the two architecture firms Correct. we're working with. There's also the SED, which is how we're getting some financing, just like let's have fun <laughs> with acronyms. So we have mentioned the complexity and the confusion around the, the length yeah. of this project. So it's a lot of VIPs, Larry. Yeah. We'll get it all to you. <laughs> but for clarity's sake, if that's even possible at this point, SEI is everything three through twelve. Yep. SWBR is K through two. Right. So SWBR is Council Rock, SEI is outside this building. And campus is over the whole thing. So. Correct. Correct. With both projects. Yep. And again, that's the, well, you see those, with what's, what's being awarded on that, and we talked about that earlier, and all of that has been reviewed and recommended to us. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Now, the other remaining bit of the evening, uh, could we have a motion, please, to approve the cooperative energy electric supply bid, please? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded down at that end down there. Uh, this is uh, this is the cooperative energy supply bid uh, through BOCES 2, um, and it is basically 
uh, a group there that uh, the motion's due on our behalf for our electricity supply. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, I will make note that the uh, this is for the fiscal year um, 2019, That's I believe, coming up. And uh, right, January 2019 through December 2019. We do make note that it is slightly higher. We're paying 7.2. Good evening and welcome to the Brighton Central School District Board of Education Community Forum uh, for February 26th, 2019. And we welcome all those that are in attendance here in the uh, cafeteria here at Council Rock School tonight and those who uh, may be watching at a future rebroadcast on the YouTube channel. Uh, so we welcome everybody. This is the second of our two forums that we normally hold. Uh, this year we did try something for those of you that were with us earlier, a little bit different and decided to take the show on the road, if you will. And we did hold our fall forum at French Road. It was very well attended. Uh, and so we decided to come to Council Rock this evening uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, we've begun our construction project here uh, with this building and also to give the opportunity uh, for more folks to come in and see the building and, and, and that type of thing. So uh, what we're gonna do this evening is we're gonna have a short update on two items with regard to the blueprint plan. Uh, from uh, Dr. McGowan is going to start in a moment. We want to update folks on where we are with the budget process and budget plan and our thought exchange results. And then we want to provide an update on our diversity, equity, inclusion efforts. And then we uh, are going to have an exercise as a community to discuss some of the items that are of interest to folks. So, Dr. McGowan. Thank you. I appreciate it. So we are, uh, first of all, hoping that everybody in the community will attest to our energy savings concept by the frigid temperatures in this room tonight. We do apologize. It is a little bit, a uh, little bit chilly, um, but it, it certainly plays into conversation about efficiencies for sure. We're also uh, speaking of efficiencies. Nine minutes over schedule already. So I'm saying this to the four people that will present after me. Uh, we want to keep that in mind because the. Uh, circles that we'll have after around gathering community feedback we really need an hour to do that so we're going to go through this quickly with the acknowledgement that all this information will be available on the web we'll answer questions at, at any time um, and happy to get into it deeper but we're moving quickly so we have time really for the conversation after which is more important so this is a presentation of the annual budget survey and what we've done this year a little bit differently than we had in the past is a conversation differently in the community not a a survey as much as an exchange. So uh, using the Thought Exchange platform as a forum to have a conversation as opposed to just gathering in a more static way, feedback in a survey format, which doesn't allow everybody in the community to see how somebody else feels and to weigh in on that conversation and rate basically their comments and then add their own thoughts, go in and add more thoughts, rate more thoughts, engage in a dialogue in the community differently than the kind of more static environment of just seeing how people answered a through whatever uh, letter. And the previous community budget survey gave us pretty much very similar results every year. And the way it was structured, not necessarily intentionally, but it did point out that, well, these are things prioritized by people, which are extracurriculars, electives, the non-mandates. We like these things. And 
Uh, we also don't like the idea of cutting them. It was a pretty predictable result, to be honest with you, and we wanted a little bit more authentic uh, source of data. So we did a little bit differently this year to try and see if we could get at the conversation differently. Just to mention to you where we are in the process, October through December, we really look at the preliminary budget items. We start to form the budgets here, analyze our progress uh, throughout the year, and how programs are working. In January, the governor proposes his uh, budget, and that's the first time we have a concept of what the revenue might look like. And we start contacting state representatives and weighing in with them on what the governor's proposal might mean to our district. We participate in a lot of advocacy efforts through the superintendent's council and the school board's council, NISCUS and NISBA. Then in February, we uh, gather community feedback every year, as I said, and that's what we did this year. And then we really take a finer look at each of the areas for expenditures and what the revenue is there uh, to support. We submit uh, advocacy letters to our legislators, which we uh, have already talking to them about the impact of the governor's proposal and what we're hoping for from them, and make appointments to spend time individually with legislators, which we have as well and are all set up at this point. In March, we look uh, in even more detail at each of the budget areas. We communicate with the community through the community budget forums, make the executive budget proposal on March 26th to the board, and we continue our advocacy right up through the finalization of the state budget, which we always hope happens, of course, end of March by April 1st. <coughs> state budget gets finalized. It has. Uh, routinely now for many, many years, after years of it being late. The board then adopts a budget. We make revisions to the executive budget proposal based on the finalized state budget, and then uh, the board adopts a proposed budget that would be then presented to taxpayers in early April. We have a budget hearing on the 14th, and the vote, of course, on the 21st. So what did we gather in terms of community feedback and who participated? About 400 participants. Uh, offered 353 different thoughts, 21,000 ratings of thoughts. So what's really interesting uh, about that is the significant uh, number of thoughts that were rated, the amount of time people did spend on rating thoughts. Um, it, it seems to have been significant, a uh, high rate of participation from people who did enter the exchange. 154 people uh, were involved in that, 230 participants, uh, again, rated thoughts, and 154 had added their own thoughts. These are really hard to read necessarily on this screen, so the good news is it's all coming out to you. But very quickly to go through with you the top 10 thoughts uh, shared. And when I say top 10, because the star ratings given by members of the community on the right-hand side give you a rank order of these. Be financially responsible with funds and tax increases, which is good for the community's long-term future, was the highest rated uh, thought. Just trying to make sure, find a way for you to see it a little bit better. <laughs> Highly qualified teachers in every classroom. Keep resources focused on students' classrooms, academic programs, high quality academics. Our top five thoughts, all dealing with programs in the classroom and the value our community places on those. Maintaining as much of the current offered curriculum with minimal cuts. If administrative overhead is not needed, should trim that first. Brighton should strive to offer as much variety it can to keep options available for students. Maintain excellence associated with a Brighton education, the best thing for kids in our community. Meeting academic and social emotional needs of students. Recent transportation study presented opportunities for efficiencies, implement them, maintaining a strong academic program at BCSD. So again, our community very focused on keeping resources closest to kids. A couple of the analysis items, just our general thoughts when we review this data and things we'll be talking more about throughout the budget process. One, I want to point out to you the moderation, because when we've done other exchanges, people have been asked, have asked, how did comments get moderated? Because not all comments get included in the exchange. The vast majority do, 24 comments were reviewed, 14 of those were taken out, so of all the comments submitted. And they were only taken out if they were uh, met the criteria to be removed. In other words, they were rude, uh, hurtful, or off topic, or identified somebody negatively. They would be filtered. You could be filtered by a moderator through the company or through a, a participant in the exchange. Anybody participating could flag a comment that would be removed. We promised in this particular exchange that every single comment would be reviewed within 36 hours, so it would go back into the exchange for people to rate that, so it wouldn't be out for very long. And the comments were not reviewed by board members uh, or by any member of the leadership team uh, for, uh, for elimination or, or for keeping. So that was done independent of all those groups uh, as well. The analysis for the exchange is in the hands of every user and continues to be. So for you, you will, when you receive all this information tomorrow, or even now, if you're a part of the exchange, you can go back in and look at all of this. Um, throughout the exchange, it's always available. But then tomorrow, when you get the email, you'll be able to go to a website constructed that has all of the comments. You can go through every single one of them, see the order. 
A PDF will go out to the community with all the comments also that includes the responses to some comments where there were specific questions asked. Out of all the comments, that really results in maybe about 10 different responses or so on particular um, items that needed some clarification. Um, you will also receive in on the website, you'll be able to go to a place where the comments, all 154, were themed and fall into certain buckets, which I'll explain in a moment as well. What we found was respondents continue to be focused on high quality programming. 126 of the 154 thoughts dealt with that, which is, you know, obviously the vast majority. They continue to be supportive of non-mandates. They're supportive but cautious regarding tax increases as well. And some of the comments, they're not at all supportive. And some, they are saying this is worthwhile in the program, but cautious and saying, you know, you need to be really careful about uh, pricing people out of the community. You need to be careful about going over the tax cap. You need to be careful and give this consideration. And some with stronger language saying, don't do that. And some saying, no, I would support that if it supports the programs that are important to me. So a mixed bag there, but again, you can see all those comments. And really for the first time, we received a lot more comments about social, emotional, and mental health than we would have in past surveys. So where people could offer, this gets to the point of the static nature of a survey, you only get answers to the questions you're asking, but in a format like this, you get a lot more than what you'd expect. So you're not shaping the dialogue, you're receiving all of the feedback. When we had open-ended sections in previous surveys, only we would see that and we would code those comments and report that back to the community. But you're only as a community then seeing the comments the way we perceive them or what their meaning is and you're not seeing all of the comments. In this format, you're seeing them in real time by participating in this and we're getting the results that you would like us to see as opposed to just the answers to the questions that we are asking. So a much more participatory, participatory uh, approach. This is where the comments broke down. Again, vast majority in the academic program opportunities area. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the other comments, these were the themes, basically the buckets that they uh, fell into. The small, smallest number around advocacy, tax cap, high quality staff, taxes. Uh, this is just the number of comments, not the star ratings. But most of them about academic program opportunities, arts, athletics, and kind of the extras. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, additional ideas that we will review and discuss and continue to think about, and we'd like the community also our supports for all students, their interests, extracurricular activities, the additional supports in place that allow all students to be successful, and this is really important, so that equity piece of the types of things that are happening that allow everybody to have a high graduation rate and rate of success in the district. Equity and efficiency, uh, the importance of funding for efforts regarding specifically regarding equity, was mentioned several times by people offering comments also. <laughs> there were several people that asked about the transportation uh, study that's been done in the past and efficiencies that way. What we would like to point out to people is that we will be looking more at efficiencies going forward, particularly when we add full day kindergarten and can redesign the transportation system when we will have to add buses. Currently, some of the suggestions made in the transportation study would be efficiencies in terms of uh, the timing of routes and some help, but none of which would have eliminated buses, which is where you are able to reduce costs. So there weren't really a lot of efficiencies in terms of costs that could be included in the bus, bus uh, system. But we'll continue to explore those as well. And then administrative costs were pointed out uh, in several different uh, comments. Again, not uh, a surprise. The number of administrators or administrative costs um, in our area actually are among the lowest in the region. So it's one of the comments that we responded to people just so they are aware of what the actual numbers are. These two charts just illustrate, uh, this <coughs> is based on the accurate data reported by every one of our uh, neighboring districts. And you can see our percent of operating expenses among the lowest around the, in the administrative area, just 13.17% uh, or $2,400 per student. So part of what people see when they see the administrative component, it's the entire cost of the overhead to support students. It's not just administrators and their salaries in that category, but rather the overall cost of administering uh, the program. It's a specific definition uh, provided by the state. And then the administrators in the district, and again, a relatively small number, especially when compared to school districts of a similar size. So up on the left-hand side, well, you can see the number of FTE or full-time equivalency in this district. So it, it's remained relatively small. This tool also allows us to look at divergent thoughts in the district. So the algorithm finds groups of people who had similar patterns of starring comments and then breaks them down to give you some comparison of where did these two distinct groups of people fall on certain items. The group, this particular slide just shows you, again, it's a different way that we look at it. Uh, particular, these two groups, similar starring patterns, 
there were 76 people in group A, 36 people in group B, and group A says if it means going over the cap, so be it. They rated that a 4.4, but group B completely disagreed and rated that a 1.1. Uh, contrary to that, group B, uh, please comply with the tax cap. New York State uh, tax residents received for complying with the cap actually means something to those who aren't wealthy or upper middle class. Group A totally disagrees with that, 1.6. Uh, stars and not surprisingly group B gave that 5.0 um, star rating so it's an interesting way for us to analyze those results to see where two distinct groups of people fall down on things not surprising in the current climate for all of us people are on opposite ends of the spectrum in on some of these comments and in many cases very equal splits and there's different ways that these are uh, broken down another way that we look at is the common thought so what do people agree on what are things that we know are really important to a lot of people one is being financially responsible with the funds and tax increases, shifting to group bus stops. And again, that comment about recent transportation study and finding efficiencies there was something that everybody seems to agree on and for us to be thinking about. And then uh, where there were common thoughts rated low, so where they uh, kind of seem to all agree that this is not a good thing. Um, full day K. I don't think it's full day K. The person or people are not trying to say that they think full day K is a bad idea, but rather the fact that we don't have it yet is uh, something that people seem to be uh, discouraged about. By the way, 2021, and when you see the big yellow things outside, which are tractors that I won't name correctly, but I'll say are doing the construction here, we will be having it, and that's still on tap. Um, and somebody, uh, of course, I thought about expediting the full year, our uh, full day kindergarten program as well. So we're able to go in and take a look at a lot of those uh, different ways to look at it. Again, hate to go through it so fast, but in the interest of time, wanting to get to the rest of it, uh, that, that's where we're at. We will email all this information to the community tomorrow. We encourage you to provide us more feedback, tell us what you think, and uh, certainly communicate that to us. That link will allow anybody to dig into the information, including this presentation, so you see how we looked at it, uh, but also to take a look for people themselves. It's fully transparent and accessible for everybody in the community to weigh in on as well. So. While I continue the motor mouth presentation, I would like to present to you the uh, Reverend Dr. Marla Washington, who is our diversity consultant. And Marla is going to give you a very quick sketch of his work and what's been happening, and then introduce Carolyn, Lou, and Debbie, who are uh, chairing each of the subcommittees uh, that the Diversity Equity Committee district wide have been working on. Marla. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, and to Mark and members of the Board of Education. It's good to be back with you again, and members of the community. It's just good to be here again. I, I'll be 30 seconds, uh, and then I can sit down. Um, uh, what we're doing, and my name is Marla Washington, and I'm the diversity consultant and also facilitator of the uh, Diversity and Equity Committee. That committee comprises of about 40 individuals who represents both the, the district as well as members of the community, parents, and um, we, that committee has been made up and broken down and composed into three subcommittees. And my work really uh, could, is, is really uh, uh, is, is, is blessed because of these three individuals and what they do to uh, make this work really, really great. And so I'm going to sit down and let them come up and do the majority of the pre all of the presentation on behalf of the Diversity and Equity Committee. Um, so we have Dr. Debbie Baker, who is the uh, chair of our family engagement, Karen Robidoux, who is our chair of our special education, and Lou Alemo, who is our chair of the hiring practice, and they will come up and make their presentation. Thank you. I'm going to start talking while Kevin gets this queued up. And as he said, in the interest of time, um, just a reminder that this is all available. And I guess I would strongly encourage you to go and take a look at it because there's a lot of information here. Um, we talked about some of the diversity equity um, endeavors or work that's going on across the district. It's both from the diversity equity committee as well as curriculum council and the district leadership team. And I'm going to be highlighting those. Um, very quickly. But what we wanted to do first was provide you with somewhat of a context because while we live this every day, 
we also recognize the fact that you guys all have lives and so you may go in and out with regards to visiting um, what we've been doing but we really you know you may not have a comprehensive idea we started our journey um, a year and a half ago we certainly aren't done I don't want to I don't want to Im imply that we are but um, again without going through each one of those we've been engaged in professional development of our staff you'll see here on the next couple of slides multiple opportunities where we've engaged with not only the entire staff on implicit bias training but also individual staff working with consultants in the field around looking at some curriculum and making it more culturally responsive we've also had several opportunities to engage with our students where our students panels have come in and really helped us better understand who we are as a district and where our work needs to be so I would strongly encourage you to after the meeting access this and kind of go down through and say wow you know there are some things that we have been doing like I said we're not done yet there's certainly lots of work but we've started down the path um, I wanted to start tonight by looking at our leadership team as I said um, a, a few minutes ago our leadership team this year has been tasked with looking at our discipline practices we actually started this work last year where we broke down our discipline by um, by uh, demographic by race we really wanted to see um, what was there with regards to how our students were um, being disciplined and, and types of uh, infractions that they were receiving and we recognize the fact that we do have issues we do have disparities amongst our um, amongst our student population which has just caused us this year to pull back and say why might that be so we continue to investigate um, not only some of the causes for the discipline but how we label those because we really want a consistent message we want to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples um, and then we've also started to I guess dip our toe if you will into this idea of restorative practices because we know in the field those um, can be really um, beneficial when it comes to helping our students um, grow and learn as individuals as well as how we can um, we can help them to better um, better uh, you know be better I guess um, family engagement so that's a group that as Marlo said that's the subcommittee that I'm heading up this year we were tasked by the blueprint to really look at how we um, how we engage with families we to date have we've done a survey amongst our parents of color group um, we also did a survey with our new parents to the um, to the district through our uh, our, our uh, welcome back reception that we had for them as well as tapping into our uh, parents of our NL English as a new language learners really to try to gauge from them or get in input from them with um, with regards to how you know did they feel welcome in Brighton um, how how was the communication and from that this committee um, is really taking a look at making recommendations we haven't quite um, finished those yet but really say it's starting to fill the gaps um, through some of the information that we got what are we missing um, you know what what types of things should we do to better engage our families and last is um, the last area that I head up is this idea of culturally responsive curriculum this has actually been an area of study by the curriculum council for about a year and a half now um, where the entire council has engaged in what aspects of cultural responsiveness should we be looking at this idea of what is culture and what does that really mean and how should our curriculum be um, be kind of viewed as windows and mirrors and um, helping our students not only see themselves within that curriculum but also be able to understand others and so um, right now uh, the committee is just finishing up by the end of this year hopefully looking at um, updating the way we purchase materials and textbooks for recommendations to be more culturally sensitive we are also looking to create some tools around um, thinking more deeply about what we teach students and how we teach them and then third we're looking at and have designed some professional development that I'm happy to say our entire student student body our entire st teaching staff k-12 um, will be participating in throughout the summer that's directly related to some of the work we've been doing total fast total flyby um, and again I would encourage you to access this um, on the web and then call me if you have any questions Lou Hey, good evening. So my work piggybacks off piggybacks off of what uh, Dr. Baker just said. And um, with the curriculum piece of it, our task or what I'm chairing is to diversify our work staff or workforce rather, and our teaching staff so that our they're reflective of our student populations. 
So as we are brainstorming our action plan, a real practical task of um, changing our hiring practices, improving our hiring practices, we divided into, or divided into three work groups. So one, how do we recruit uh, diverse candidates? And simultaneously, we have to say, what's the environment that will attract um, diverse candidates? So we have to really look in the mirror and say, what do we aspire to be? What are our goals um, to be able to achieve number one? And then once we're successful in one and two, what's going to be our retention efforts to make sure that everyone is successful in, in our system? So dividing into those two, we have the charge for the recruitment piece of it. And you can read what the charge is. But essentially, we want to develop action plans to diversify our teaching staff. So what does that look like? We've been, we have engaged, excuse me, uh, Renee Baker, who has lived this task uh, in her career. She's been doing it at the higher education level. And she's been educating us on the practices and the policies and the procedures. What, what's it look like at the secondary level? And then we're adapting it to the K-12 level. So you can see some of the charges there. What we've been working on first is um, we're going into our hiring season right now. So we're putting together a really aggressive action plan on um, recruiting diverse candidates. So we're uh, compiling different information. We're doing everything that's uh, being recommended and that's done at the secondary level uh, to be successful. Our first attempt is at the NEMNET Minority Recruitment Fair. Uh, we're sending Dr. Hall, Renee Baker is going to be joining us with Dr. Baker, and that's going to be our first stab at piloting the new procedures and um, implementation plan. I speak like an accountant, so forgive me. But that's really what we're doing, is we're, do we're implementing and we're executing an action plan based on all the work of the subcommittee. What we're doing on the environment side is, this is our charge for that, I won't read it to you, but essentially we're saying, all right, we need to invite candidates um, to help us build what we want to be. So first we have to look in the mirror and say, what does that look like? What are the attributes that we aspire to grow and to uh, develop in Brighton? So we have to do a really hard self-assessment, and that's what this committee is looking at. What do we, how do we want to divide the environment? What do we want to promote? And then we have to invite candidates to join us to build it. We're not there right now, but we are trying to design and define what that vision is. So here's the action steps, and we're looking at survey data, and we're working with student groups, we're working with our administrative team to try to define those environmental factors. Um, and um, you know, through surveys, we're looking at different tools. That work is really just beginning right now. Uh, we have a lot more work to do in that, but that's generally the gist of, of the action plan that we're, uh, we're engaged in currently. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mrs. Rabideau. Really quick, we're already uh, minus two minutes here, I see. Uh, I am the chairman of the special education group that got together to talk about uh, diversity and equity in special education and what does that look like. It has been an ongoing conversation. see heads going, yep, yeah, good. Glad you're having that conversation. It has been an ongoing conversation. Um, very, some, some really interesting things have come up and people have been able to talk about their feelings and what they, what they have seen in special education. Our charge was to analyze the special education data to determine areas of disproportionality. And we got together and we gave all the data to a large group, including parents and board members and faculty, to look at all of our data and look independently look at it and then we came together to identify our areas of concern and what can we prioritize in the next um, coming school year so the areas that we found that were supported by data is that students of color boys uh, even more than girls all boys and students classified as other health impairment those three categories showed disproportionality in our data Areas of disproportionality identified through observation. This is the conversations and through our experiences, we see that transfer students, students with a strong advocate, maybe uh, families or teachers that are really advocating <coughs> for a certain student, um, English uh, as a new language students, and students with behaviors. We cannot, we don't have data through IEP Direct to support that. That's, it's impossible to pull that information out, but we can support that through our own observation. And we talked about how do our biases affect the outcomes for students. After we looked at all our data, we said, okay, what's happening for our groups of kids? What's, 
what, what can we expect? And we said that biases may be affecting our students having access to all of our programs. It may be affecting how we communicate with families, our classification rate, and our long-term outcomes for students. The next question is, well, what are we going to do about that? And we had a long, lots of conversations, and we came up with three things to focus on in the coming year. Strengthen tier one instruction, meaning look at culturally responsive pedagogy, inclusive practices, and examining unconscious bias. And the, the group felt that if we start to look at these big picture items, we would start to be able to have an influence on our students in special education. And that is, I think I'm the end of our presentation, and I will let Dr. McGowan take over. Yeah, so actually it's my pleasure now to turn it over to Hennessy Lostico, who's a counselor at Brighton High School, and Kimberly Ball, who's a counselor here at Council Rock. And they're going to facilitate a little bit of a different approach to the community forum, which is to utilize restorative practices. So they're going to divide us up into two groups and then engage us in a conversation, again, in a different manner of gathering feedback and having an opportunity to have a conversation. Hennessy and Kim, take away. Okay. Super. This has been a special presentation from the Brighton Central School District Board of Education. 